All right, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the slight delay, technical hitch, but thank you for joining us for today's Bermuda College and Bermuda Environmental Sustainability Task Force Lunch and Learn, the third in our third season. My name is Jennifer Flood, and I'm a member of the BEST Executive Committee. The idea for these three presentations came about in conversation between Amy Harvey, Senior Lecturer at Bermuda College, and Kim Smith, Ex Executive Officer at BEST when it was felt that there was a need for informed public discussion on the many issues of concern in the Bermuda community. To facilitate this, we've invited local experts to speak on a variety of topical issues to which all members of the public, including schools, are invited. Interestingly, today's presentation was initiated by concerns expressed over the incidence of cancer in Bermuda by the Bermuda College students themselves. Amy will introduce today's speaker. Amy? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Chris Foster today, our clinical oncologist and expert um, that's going to share his uh, expertise on uh, cancer and how it is uh, being affected and affecting our environment. Uh, he's the medical director and radiation oncologist at Bermuda Cancer and Health, um, the director of cancer services at King Edward VII Memorial Hospital. Uh, an affiliate member of the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and a consultant, consultant sorry, at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. As a clinical oncologist, Dr. Foster is qualified to treat pa cancer patients with radiation therapy, chemotherapy, molecular therapy, and immuno immunotherapy. Dr. Foster was the clinical lead in the project that brought radiation therapy to the country of Bermuda for the first time. He and his team are, are working hard to make sure that our Bermudian population has access to top cancer care, um, making it uh, accessible to them on the island and helping them to have a great um, uh, local uh, uh, care uh, facility at hand. So we welcome Dr. Uh, Chris Foster and we look forward to his uh, thoughts and expertise. Thank you. So thank you guys. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm gonna be talking about cancer in the environment. And as Amy's just articulated, my background is as a cancer specialist Specialise really in the treatment of cancer. Um, part of that does come into the prevention element. And so some of this talk is talking about what we can do to change our cancer risks. Focusing on the environmental side, and what I found fascinating presenting, uh, preparing for the talk was there's not really a singular body globally that is necessarily pulling the information together. And that's one of the challenges. And one of the challenges I had preparing for the talk and why I've stipulated it's an opinion rather than a necessary hard fact is you've got the environmental aspect, you've got the population health aspect, which comes under the guidance, guidance of public health physicians, who previously were not very well known, but we all know them that very well now with the pandemic. And then oncologists are often asked their opinion and on the side, but we're often at the end of the pathway. So we treat people who've been diagnosed with cancer, but of course, when there's a burden of disease, when there's a change, you need to switch the conversation from treatment to prevention, which is something we're doing in Bermuda. Um, we are writing a national cancer control plan and trying to work out how we control our cancer burden. And this falls into this. So that's looking at our risks, looking at what we can do to change. So first of all, from, from an academic perspective, no conflicts of interest, you might disagree with what I say as we go through, but it's not driven by any financial interests or any investment interests. So the aims over the next half an hour or so, I'm um, going to talk through cancer burden and how exposures to certain things increase your risk. Then we'll look at environmental carcinogens, lifestyle carcinogens, information on social media and things that influence our decisions. A couple of slides at the end on hot topics. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, what can we do? Um, I suspect by the end of this talk, about a third of you would have glazed over. A third of you will hopefully be stimulated to think more, to act more, to ask more questions. And I suspect about a third of you will also be a little bit frustrated um, because you want, people want hard answers and they want hard facts. And when you're looking at carcinogens, which are things that drive cancer, it's surprisingly hard to get really strong scientific information. A lot of it is based on theories, calculations, statistics. And we all know how statistics can be manipulated 
So hopefully, at least the third of you are stimulated by the end, and we'll see how we go. So talking about cancer burden initially. So cancer is a worldwide problem, and it's a growing problem. So here, stolen a slide that talks that nearly 10 million people a year are dying from cancer. 70% of those do happen in developing countries. Um, it says a third, so the science is between a third and a half of cancers are preventable. And then talks massively about costs. So I saw this slide because it's got the dollar sign, because there's a theme running through the talk, and that's the influence of money and the influence of economics, sometimes positive, often negative, in terms of how it drives people's thought process, how it drives science, rightly or wrongly. And then more importantly for the audience today, think about us, think about Bermuda. Um, so these, unfortunately, are slightly outdated slides, but clearly show, so on the left of your screen, the registry data for uh, 2007 to 2016, the orange line is all cases of cancers that have been registered here in Bermuda. And you can see a sharp and steady rise of the number of cancer cases. Um, traditionally, you're supposed to take out C44, which is the code for skin cancer. Um, but obviously, with such a solar presence, a sun presence here on Bermuda, I think it's reasonable that we do look at it. On the right side of the screen is taken from Healthcare Review 2017, which is looking at Bermuda's health issues. And this is looking at our prevalence of cancer, age standardized, so it's kind of taking out the fact that we've got an aging population, which does skew it even more. And as you can see, we're on the wrong side of the stats. So the yellow line in the middle is the average across OECD countries, and we're there in the blue towards the wrong end. And so hopefully by the end of today, we'll look through and have an understanding why we're at that wrong end. So how do exposures increase the risk of cancer? So this is kind of the science behind it, and this is where a lot of the challenges come along. So the simple explanation is our bodies are exceptionally clever. We made up a lot of DNA that kind of tells our body how to behave, how to grow. And mutations within DNA are what drive cancer. So on the right side there, you've got mutations inactivate genes. And this thing's called tumor suppressor genes. So as they've learned about genes, they've spotted a gene that seems to inhibit excess growth of cells. So they called it a tumor suppressor gene. You need a number of mutations along the way. So you need mutations in the suppressor genes, in the repair genes, in the proto-oncotype genes, and uh, more suppressor genes. And on paper, that's quite simple. So you're talking about four or five mutations, and then it turns into cancer. The reality is that every single day within each of your cells, there is somewhere between a 1,000 and a million mutations happening every single day. And our bodies are clever. They spot them, and they repair them. And so that cell carries on normally. And they're also clever. They put little things called telomeres on the end. So they work out how old a cell can be before it gets dangerous and it needs to be apoptosed, which is the body's version for killing the cell, getting rid of it because it's starting to become a risk. To get cancer, you only need um, about 10 mutations sometimes. But if you consider that there's millions and millions and millions of mutations happening within your body every single day and that there's no signature left behind. So when we find cancer, and we biopsy it, we take a little bit of the tissue, and we dig down into it, we can find mutations, we can work out where it might have come from, but there's not a certainty, there's not a fact. Even though we know, and everyone knows, and I'll talk about it in a minute, that smoking drives lung cancer, it counts for about 90% of lung cancer. You could be sat in front of someone who has smoked their whole life, and they've got lung cancer, but you can't actually say with certainty it's the smoking that caused it. It's probable, and again, that comes back to statistics, which is always a challenge, because they can be manipulated. So then when we talk about carcinogens, which is the term for things found in the environment that can drive cancer, we know in the factual sense that there are a number of carcinogens that cause human cancer. And we know there's lots and lots of other things that probably cause cancer. But what we don't know is each individual cancer, which mutation happened. Was it a mutation you're born with? Was it a mutation you picked up along the way because of how you've chosen to live? Was it a mutation that happened because you've been exposed to something that you have no choice with exposure, like the sun, can't avoid the sun? Or was it something that just happened anyway because your own body just missed something? Yeah, you know, our bodies are pretty clever, but they're not perfect. And offense, 
sometimes cancer is just a reality of imperfection within our bodies. And that's what makes it really hard. And that's what makes studying carcinogens challenging. And that's why it falls under lots of different people. So in front of us is a really, really long, dull list that comes from the National Toxicity Program, which is from the Department of Health and Human Sciences in the US, and it's their 14th edition. And it's got over 400 things listed. And what it has in the known carcinogens is the one where they're scientifically 100% sure that these listed above cause cancer. What it doesn't do is weight the risk. So in a sense, we know that exposure to cigarette smoke has a high risk of causing lung cancer. We also know that exposure to red meat has a confirmed risk of causing cancer. It definitely causes cancer. But the risk of it causing cancer over time is actually quite low. So again, when you look at the one at the top there, so just highlighting a few, which we'll come back to, so alcohol. So alcohol definitely causes cancer. And yet we don't see too much in the media, we don't see too much pressure to get rid of alcohol because we know it causes cancer, but the chance of it causing cancer is relatively low. And again, it comes to manipulating statistics. So if they look at people who've never drunk and then they look at people who drink a moderate amount, there is definitely a scientific difference, statistically different, between how long you're expected to live and whether you're expected to get cancer or not. But the numbers are relatively low. If you just look at lifespan, it's kind of six months difference over the age of 80. So you can say if you don't smoke, you might live to 81 and a half. Sorry, not smoke, drink. If you don't drink, you might live to 81 and a half. If you do drink, you might live to 81. And when you look at it really simplistically, that suggests that it's six months at the age of 80. I might not be too worried about that. Right now, I might go home, celebrate surviving this talk and have a glass of wine. And that's the kind of choice I'm making. Again, Statistics can be interpreted differently. Six months doesn't sound much, but actually the reality is that six months comes from 20 people living to 82, having drunk, one person dying at the age of 60 from cancer that's come around from alcohol. And suddenly the thought of dying at 60 because I go home and choose to go, have a glass of wine is a little bit more scary and a little bit more concerning. And that's when it becomes hard and it becomes choices. The other ones I'm going to talk about, as listed there, so viruses. I'm sure everyone is fed up with talking about viruses, but we can't help it because there's lots of viruses in the world and there's been lots of them around for a long time uh, and lots of them cause cancer. And then we could talk about radon, solar radiation, smoking, aromatic hydrocarbons. And then we are briefly going to talk about how sugar has never made this list, which goes against what a lot of people perceive. And that's when we're going to come around to talking about perception and understanding science and interpreting science. So environmental carcinogens. Starting off relatively dry, we all know um, that sun uh, causes cancer. We also all know that we can't really avoid it. You know, we can't turn off the sun or else the world would die. So we have to learn ways to live with it and mitigate it. So the mechanism for sun causing cancer is relatively straightforward. The sun comes down. The UV rays snap DNA and they do what's called double strand snaps, breaks, and they're not repairable. So over time, eventually one of those double strand breaks within the skin will be in a pathway that leads to cell proliferation and leads to cancer. So in the middle there, um, we've got the numbers of Bermuda's cancers over the last nine years, actually about 2007, 2016, and you can see, not surprisingly, skin cancer comes out top. So it's a big problem. Uh, we talk about it a fair amount. I don't see too much lobbying or conversations or promoting because a lot of what SunSmart is, and a slight plug for Bermuda Cancer and Health, you run the SunSmart program, it's sensible, it's logical, it's simple, and it can be done and it should be done. And it's a personal choice. Again, that comes around later in the theme. It's something easy to do. It doesn't affect other people. So it kind of gets accepted and it doesn't necessarily cause much media excitement. It doesn't necessarily cause much conversation. Which leads us to radon. So radon is up there in one of the biggest causes. And according to the slide I've stolen from the American Lung Association, it's the number one environmental cause of cancer death and the number two cause of lung cancer after smoking, um, which to be complete is after smoking and passive smoking it's there. But again, we don't read much about it. We 
some of us know about it, we're aware of it. Again, there's some information on it on the uh, Bermuda Cancer and Health website. Um, but I couldn't find anywhere in the World Wide Web any information about how much radon we have in Bermuda. And actually, there's limited information about how much radon you have around the world, even though it is a clear driver of cancer. So all radon is is an odorless, invisible, tasteless gas that comes out of the ground. So as uranium decays and uranium's there in our soil and gets turned into lead, radon gets released and we inhale it and it can cause lung cancer. The reason we don't see much about it, although there is some advice, is because there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. So again, when we're talking about risks and choices, we're also talking about mitigation and what we can do to change things. Um, so on the right of the screen is a map of the UK where they have done radon mapping and you see down in Cornwall, which is a beautiful part of the UK, it's red hot and it really does increase the risk of cancer living down there. But people still make that choice. They like the open air, they like the sea, they like the exercise opportunities they get down there. And there's nothing much you can do about it. There are things you can increase the ventilation in your home, you can change the airflow, but minimal. So again, the reason it doesn't get much interest is because we can't do much about it. So then switching, diesel and fossil fuels. So I suspect as this talk has been pulled together by an environmental team that you guys probably know as much about this as I do. So diesel and fossil fuels are linked to cancer. Interestingly, they don't make the top list. They don't make the definite, they make the probable, which is when we come round to mitigate um, manipulation of science, and it's when we come round to population science. And this is the challenge when you're trying to prove something that is everywhere, when you're trying to prove that it actually causes cancer. So the challenge with diesel and fossil fuels is that you can't really do a controlled study. So you can't take a thousand people and give them no diesel or fossil fuel exposure and a thousand people and give them lots of diesel and fossil fuel exposure, which is when you run the challenge of comparing things that are seen in labs compared to things which are seen in real life. And often what you see in labs doesn't correspond to what you see in real life. And then with this example, you can't recreate this. Firstly, ethically, you couldn't sit a thousand people down and just pile them full of diesel and fossil fuels. And also the other thousand, you can't take them away completely. So you end up doing what's called population studies, epidemiological studies, where you're looking at people living in cities and comparing them to people who live in the countryside. And so then you can work out what are people in the cities exposed to, what's their cancer rate, and you see higher rates of cancer. So fossil fuels have been linked, so people living in cities have seen more lung cancer, lymphoma, sarcoma, skin, bladder, breast, esophagus, laryngeal, myeloma, and prostate cancers. And so then you jump to the conclusion, that's because of diesel and fossil fuels. But then you get other people pushing back. And whether they're pushing back with the correct motivation or not is publicly known that it's not, it's driven by money. Um, a lot of the pushback is driven by people making money. And this is the little history that we all probably know quite well about some of the lobbying and the pushing backwards and forwards and how much has previously been known about the health risks of fossil fuels and the health risks of diesel fuels and how the conversation could get pushed backwards and forwards. And the scientists employed by Exxon et al are able to point out that as well as having more diesel and fossil fuels within cities, you also tend to have a different diet. You tend to have a different exercise regime. You have different levels of economic wealth and you have hundreds and hundreds of other differences. So they're able to highlight that one big difference might be fossil fuels and diesel, but there's lots of other differences and therefore their argument is you can't prove that it's definitely that that is the causality. And that's one of the big frustrations, and one of the big challenges whenever you're trying to make change. And despite the fact that there's overwhelming information, overwhelming knowledge about the risks of fossil fuels, the risks of diesel, you still see, so bottom right hand corner, um, one of my favorite little left wing newspapers last week or the week before highlighted that despite all this knowledge and despite the fact we'd like to move to much more electric, we're still seeing financially driven decisions that are changing the environment we live in. So I won't go into it too much, but it's quite hard to follow why the UK government have switched where they're promoting people buying electric cars and now they're pulling back on that. The only assumption I can make is, is it's money orientated. So switching on, so I'm going to move to lifestyle. So the first couple of lifestyle ones, 
are connected to environmental and lifestyle. And again, slightly using the opportunity because lifestyles are ones we can change and ones we can do something about. And they are our environment that we are choosing to live in. And as well as the interaction between how people behave and how people behave around us. So as we talked about at the start, we have too much cancer, full stop. We have too much cancer in Bermuda and we probably have too many preventable cancers. And the stats are somewhere between three and five out of 10, 30 to 50% of cancers are preventable or driven by lifestyle. So we've already talked about the sun. Down the bottom there, uh, there is radon. And what we're gonna cover now is the top one. Just briefly, we're gonna talk through smoking. So again, we know smoking causes cancer and yet people still smoke. Actually, Bermuda does quite well. So again, this is stats taken from a while ago. So the steps analysis was performed by the Ministry of Health and it's looking at our lifestyles and it's a fascinating read. And it was updated in 2019 and due to be published about this time last year, but then this COVID thing happened. So it hasn't happened yet, but it's looking about things that we do that can impact our risk of any disease, but any disease includes cancer. So actually our smoking rate is relatively low so according to those studies, we're in the bottom two or three percent of countries in terms of the volume of people who smoke. But still, it's quite striking, even in Bermuda, that most people who are smoking are starting at a relatively young age. So starting in their teens. And again, that's choices. And why are people making that choice? So again, common knowledge, smoking causes a lot of cancer, mainly lung cancer, but it can cause just about cancer anywhere because of how it infiltrates. The first study that identified smoking as a risk, as a carcinogen, was performed in 1950, so 71 years ago. And yet, it was only five years ago, the Bermuda changed its rules. And that's not, Bermuda's not an outlier in this, this is globally, that we're very slow to act. So again, reflecting on that fossil fuel conversation, reflecting on the manipulation of companies out to make money, that suggests that it's not pure science that drives our decision. So the same thing for smoking. So what I've got up here is the smoking rules, the baking rules in Bermuda are pretty good. But again, just stolen a couple of comments down below there, uh, highlighting some of the reaction when this came in. So someone who identifies themselves as a smoker reasonably points out that the air is polluted and therefore when all the buses and Velcro disappear, he might, he, she might stop smoking. And again, it's that individual thought process that makes it very hard for changes to come about. And hot dog points out that it belongs to no one. And so therefore you're making choices. And this is where the challenge is for legislation. It's the big brother element versus choice versus risk and the impact in those others. So for me, we have good smoking legislation. I don't quite understand why we're still allowed to sell single cigarettes. So what's the benefit of that? Who does that help? It helps the people making money off it, is my opinion. So moving on. So just gonna look now at, back at the radon and x-rays and point the finger at our profession, but also at public and perception. So iatrogenic radiation. So iatrogenic is a term that means harm caused by healthcare. And the, the information on the left is different ways, lifetime risk per thousand people of how you can die. And cancer's high, and they're trying to point out that a CT scan is low, so 0.5 out of every thousand people. But when you're having choices, then it becomes a bigger number because that's something you can change. So a lot of the time, when you're looking at scanning and when you're looking at doing medical interventions, you kind of forget the harm. I actually recommended to the government here about five years ago that we brought in new legislation to control radiation producing equipment and that conversation disappeared. Um, it's not to say CT scans are wrong. CT scans are brilliant and we absolutely need them to diagnose cancer and diagnose cancer early so that we can identify cancers that can be cured and make a difference, keep people alive. But again, it shouldn't just be a fallback, but it also shouldn't be a request. The number of times I and I'm sure many others have seen people and we haven't been able to explain the problem, the symptom, you know, whether it's a hurt toe, a stomach pain, shortness of breath. And we suggested, let's go and see. And someone said, why can't you just scan me? 
and pop me through the CT scanner. And so it's just a reminder that we've all got to educate ourselves and not necessarily just assume that something is better just because we can see it. And again, there was big movement in the US to do CT scans yearly on people just to look for things. And they demonstrated they found a whole bunch of things, some of which are curable, some of which made no difference. But they also found that they uh, drove cancer change. So that's just something to kind of bear in mind when we're all thinking about the decisions we make. And then moving on to number two. So up here, keep healthy weight. And then right down at the bottom, be more active. And to me, they're intertwined and a big problem for Bermuda. So this is taken from health data, which looks at Bermuda and looks at our lifestyle risks and what are the biggest impact of things that we do that cause us to be unhealthy. And sadly, the stats show that we are an incredibly obese and overweight society. And it's our number one lifestyle risk factor that drives ill health. And it has been number one for a long time. Um, when you think about weight and the reason science last slides, so obviously there's dietary elements and there's exercise elements. And when you look at exercise and the reason it's right down the bottom there is what that says is that if you are a normal weight and you exercise or don't exercise, sorry, if you're a normal weight and you sit around, you just have to be one of these people really lucky you can sit there all day and still not gain weight then actually that's a cancer risk. You should still be exercising even if you're the ideal weight. But if you're overweight, it is a huge driver of cancer as well as a number of other conditions. And there's a general shift. Things are moving, things are changing. So this is a quick screen grab of something called Moving Medicine, which is UK driven and sponsored by the Cancer Research UK. And it's just a lot of research and a lot of information about how we should regard exercise as an intervention. We should regard exercise as a medicine, almost. But it's hard to do. And this movement here is trying to promote and educate people that if you look at it scientifically rather than whimsically and say, go out for a run, you can actually make a difference. You can really impact how people live. It's a challenge in Bermuda. Those of us who exercise and try and go out running, although Bermuda is beautiful and it feels like it's the perfect place in the world to exercise, it's either too hot, or it's too dark, or it's too windy, or it's too cold, or you can't go on the roads because they're not actually well set up for people just to be active. So the medical definition of exercise is doing something for 30 to 40 minutes that makes you breathless enough that you can't complete a conversation. So it's dead simple stuff. It's walking. Um, but we don't have much access to walking, and we do also don't have a great attitude towards exercising and the utilization of our roads. So I took this from the Royal Gazette a couple of years ago uh, about a little hit and run incident. Thankfully, no one, particularly well in, no one particularly injured, relatively minor, but the person writing in was trying to highlight a point. And I see this all the time. I go out on the roads running, and I regularly see drivers doing this or kind of say, get over. Like the roads belong to cars. They don't belong to cars. They belong to everyone. So the quote below is taken from US legislation that cyclists and pedestrians have the same legal right to access public roads as cars. And again, that often seems to be mislaid, misunderstood, misinterpreted. But again, we don't help ourselves here in Bermuda in terms of trying to get out and being active. So then moving on um, to diet. So we've got that relatively high up through. And initially, just compare diet and smoking. So again, we know from hard facts that smoking and eating red meat are comparable in terms of the strength of evidence in terms of risk of causing cancer. The difference is that the percentage of people then go on to get cancer. So just kind of highlighting on the pink, lots of people who smoke get cancer. In the blue, some people who have red meat get cancer. And it's, it's the red meat that causes it, but it's not quite the risk. And again, looking at if you change lifestyle, if no one smoked, there'd be 65,000 fewer cases in the UK. If no one ate meat, then there'd be 9,000 fewer cases. So all important, but trying to work out proportionality. Diet is a huge, huge, huge topic. Um, to really simplify it, we need to eat a lot more fruit and vegetables. So initially, the evidence came out that five times a day. Unfortunately, for those of us who struggle to do five times a day, the evidence being bumped up to 10 times a day. Uh, 10 portions a day, so other times, that we should be eating fruit and vegetables and emphasizing that it really should be fresh 
because again, the challenge is with a lot of the stuff that comes in, we don't quite know where it's been or where it's been grown. And so that, to keep it simple, um, that's the overriding advice we tend to give from oncology, is making sure it's fresh fruit and vegetables. Which leads on to the sugar myth. So I hear this all the time. And it's probably one of the most common things that people say to me, I cut out sugar to reduce the chance that I get cancer. And actually cutting out sugar might reduce the chance you get cancer because it will improve your body weight, you improve your overall immune system, improve your health. But cancer, sorry, sugar doesn't cause cancer. So cancer does use glucose because let's remember every single cancer cell in our body has come out of a normal cell. And every one of our normal cells needs glucose to grow, and that includes our immune system. So if we radically cut out sugar, we actually damage our own body's defense mechanism against cancer. So I never argue with anyone who wants to cut out sugar, because it's going to improve your health, and it may improve your body weight, which will then reduce your chance of getting cancer. So that brings me on to an industry. So. Hopefully, you're all looking at this and thinking that's a very big number, $100 billion industry. And you are probably thinking big pharma, because we all know there's concerns with big pharma and how it drives things. But actually, the industry I'm referring to is the dietary supplements. So going back to the recommendation to have fresh fruit and veg, a lot of people also come to me with a big bag of supplements. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with supplements, which I'll qualify in a sec. I'm just reminding people the theme through this is that money drives people's decision and advertising and promotion. So this little snippet is taken from a business magazine, Fortune Business Insight. It's highlighting to people that they think dietary supplements is a huge growth in the next five or six years. So it's estimated to be around 100 billion at the minute, and it's gonna go up to 117.92 billion. So that's a big difference. So again, we have to be careful when we make our assumptions about who we trust and who we don't trust. And that's when we should start to use information that we appreciate and we trust. And this is one of my favorite websites. So a lot of people talk to me about Moringa, and I think Moringa is great. The reason I think it's great is I read about it on the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center website that has a huge database about natural therapies, about herbal therapies. And it goes into great detail and it goes into language that I understand. So I'm not saying you have to use this, but in it, it has sections for healthcare professionals. And it has clinical summaries. And it highlights that in preclinical, oops, excuse me, in preclinical studies, that moringa from the leaf, from the seed, from the root has got anti cancer properties. Uh, but then again, it highlights at the bottom that this hasn't been translated into humans and needs to be looked at carefully. But the reason that I'm quite happy with it, it's also not been shown to be harmful. So it probably benefits, it hasn't been proven, and therefore it's reasonable to use and consume. Which again, so Amy's looking at the chat. If anyone can name these, I'll be impressed. So this is kind of back to big pharma conversations. So we've got five organic um, products in front, and they represent five plants. And you could probably recognize the one on the right. And again, Amy can give out awards for anyone who's sending through the correct names of the other four. And the reason I've got them up is all of them, so Pacific Yew, Happy Tree, America, May Apple, Madagascar, Periwinkle, and Marijuana, have been shown in studies to help cancer. The difference is the first four have been shown to help cancer in people. The fifth hasn't. It's been shown to help cancer in labs and in cell lines. The other four are four of the most commonly used chemotherapies that we have. So paclitaxel, topotica, and atopocytobine christine. They are four of the top 10 used chemotherapies. And there's a perception that chemotherapy is bad and it's driven by big pharma. It's not always the case. So a lot of what we use come from natural products. So paclitaxel comes from the Pacific yew tree. Docetaxel comes from the European yew tree. And it's pulling out that information and working out where we get that information from. Which kind of leads back to the term integrated oncology, which is where we try and integrate traditional science with lifestyle science with complementary science. So now I'm going to talk about viruses. 
and we should recognize a virus by now because it's everywhere we go. And unfortunately, viruses are in the environment and they're not really a choice. So this possibly should have been within the environmental section, but he's driving to the decision section of the talk. So cervical cancer, 98% of cases of cervical cancer come from the HPV, human papilloma virus. And it's been shown that there's a very effective vaccine against HPV. And if you vaccinated 70%, of the world, you'd save 180,000 lives. And most people affected by cervical cancer are young women. And the reason for the gold tablets is we're always talking about a magic bullet in oncology, something to cure cancer. Rather than curing it, prevent it be better. So why in Bermuda is the uptake only 30%, despite the fact it's accessible to all and it's free? So that comes to information sharing on social media and decision making and outside influences. So. How do we make our personal choices? What do we base our information on? Because we're all educated differently. We're all taught to think differently. And that's good because we're all unique. Um, but there's a common theme that's kind of happening at the moment. And that's the term science and the term fact and what people are trusting. And so again, picking on scientists initially, this came out day before yesterday in Nature. And it's a news feature, so it's an editorial. And it's highlighting now that particularly in the COVID, so you're seeing so much literature coming out, that there's actually companies producing fake science and getting it into what we call scientific journals. And that's very challenging to think about because we tend to read them and trust them, but then they get circulated. And what I find interesting is why certain stories really hit the headlines. So looking at Facebook, social media, so dangerous fake health news conquers Facebook. So the most shared and liked commented article in Facebook in 2016 was about dandelion weeds and how it can boost your immune system and cure cancer. And I find it very intriguing. I have no answers. Why was that the one that was shared the most? Why did it catch everyone's attention? Now, dandelion's great. We actually have dandelion on our giving wall at Bermuda Cancer and Health. That's one of the things that represents that it does make a difference for cancer. And again, it's been shown in cell lines that it can have effect against things like melanoma and leukemia and pancreas and colorectal. But it hasn't been shown in humans. And the interesting thing about this one is the researcher who was driving the research in Dandelion, she actually, she's in Canada, and she actually highlighted that all the social media and people's instant belief that they could take Dandelion and cure themselves of cancer damaged her research because she, then she was not able to do controlled trials. She wasn't able to kind of look at it properly to truly understand it. So that's interesting, it's good. It also has lots more knock-on effects than people kind of appreciate. So back to HPV. So these are the top five Facebook shares of HPV in 2016. You can see a complete split. So down the bottom, you've got things from the BBC and New York Times suggesting that it makes a positive difference. Up the top, you've got what I regard as kind of sensationalized headlines talking about deadly scan and how experts suddenly come out and say something against it. And the fact checkers, whether they're correct or not, have identified the top three as being factually incorrect, and yet they're the top three shares. And why does that negative information grab us? You know, why does that get us thinking? Is it something we're innately thinking about, or is it something that we want to go against? And I mean, for me, the most fascinating one of recent times that I'll skip through recently is how one of the most shared bits of information in 2020 was that thermometers cause pineal cancer. And you look at the origin of that story, it was one person's personal thought delivered by a blog in Australia. And then despite the fact there's no scientific rationale behind it, because infrared only goes about 0.5 millimeters through your skin and the pineal gland is pretty deep. All of a sudden, it's one of the most shared things. And you've got big institutions like Hopkins and Harvard having to come out to combat it. And it takes up a lot of time and information and it does change people's behavior. So coming to that and coming towards the end, Hot topics, so 5G and cell phones. So I put a for and against because I don't know the answer. And not any, I don't think anyone actually knows for 100% which way we should be leaning at this. So again, on the left here is a little snippet from a newspaper uh, from The Guardian UK, so a reptile left-leaning newspaper. And it, it is highlighting very real similarities between the smoking path line, the diesel, the fossil fuel path line, and how industry is put in doubt. And so that's a reason that we should be concerned. On the right, you've got very reputable scientific bodies explaining why they don't think there's any relation. 
So the American Cancer Society is pointing out that we know, scientists know, a lot about cell damage from radio frequency. Um, and it needs to be ionizing, is the understanding. So you actually need to break and nudge that electron along so that you can then damage the cells and then that damages cancer. And things that have EMFs, um, as well as 5G and cell phones, it includes radios, landlines, cell towers, power cables, radar, satellite, MRIs, microwave, cell phones, Wi-Fi, smart meters. To really understand the change and the choice, are people going to accept getting rid of everything in one of those? You know, we wouldn't be talking right now if it wasn't for Wi-Fi. And is that the right reason or not? And again, the only study that the National Institute of Cancer, National Cancer Institute in the UK, in the US, sorry, could find associating cancer with electromagnetic changes, frequency, and fields was a study done in 1979, which is quite a long time ago. And there was an association, and then it was trying to be repeated, and they weren't able to find that association again. And it doesn't mean it's wrong, it just means it's incredibly hard to study. So where do we, as a society, draw the line between understanding things, accepting things, restricting things, and when do we make that choice? So I'll leave that on there. I'll go to a simpler one. Microplastics. I hate microplastics. Everyone should hate microplastics. They probably cause cancer. No one's going to argue. And the point is, we don't know they're going to cause cancer, but no one's going to argue because everyone hates them. And that's the difference between Wi-Fi and microplastics. The evidence is about the same in some circumstances, but it's a difference of opinion and it's a difference of how people move forwards. So what can we do? So this is my last slide. Um, what we can do is live more healthily and that will significantly reduce the cancer burden globally. And for me, the easiest things are a decent diet and a decent amount of exercise. The other thing we can do is spend time thinking about and judging the information that we read and really trying to deep dive into it. And it's hugely time consuming. So if you read every single literature article based on cancer, you'd have to read 24 seven for years at a time just to keep up and that's not impossible so you have to build up your own trust schemes and i don't think there's an easy answer or a right answer but live well question everything um and make your own judgments don't believe everything people tell you and i'll pause thank you chris um um, that was really interesting and overwhelming. <laughs> um, well, we appreciate all your all your um, all your expertise and, and, as you said, opinions. But I know there's more behind those opinions of uh, science because that's where you are, scientists. Um, but we'll take any questions from the audience. Um, if people want to type in some questions, we'll definitely answer them. Um, but we have our a few of our own questions, Jennifer and I. So I don't know if Jennifer, you wanted to start or yeah, yes, yes. Um, in today's paper, the um, report on bell coefficients was released, um, and I have every confidence in uh, Dr. Smith uh, um, in what, what has been done. But to me, it raises the question, um, maybe not so much of Velcro emissions, but what they found in the sediment, which was the dioxins and the chlorons. Now, I, if I understand the article correctly, it suggested that if those two chemicals, toxic chemicals, get into the water itself, you'll be able to taste the difference. But do we, do we know the effects over minimal consumption over a long period of time? And I think that, that to me is what was missing in the report. These are snapshots of what's in the tank at one particular time, but we're not looking at actually what the people themselves um, are consuming, as, as, unless I'm wrong. As far as I know, there has been no test from humans in Bermuda to see what their um, toxin load is. Yeah, and I suspect the reason it's omitted is because it's really hard to answer. Um, so most of the things, I haven't read the article, but most of the things you've mentioned are recognized as carcinogens or thought highly suspicious to be carcinogens. But it comes down to this exposure volume and the time, and they're really hard to measure. And that's the challenge with knowing what to do next with reports like this. So it clearly highlights concerns, 
but the options are really challenging and limiting. It'd be very hard to work out ways to reduce the exposure without a massive, massive, massive change. And it's not saying massive change is wrong, but that's where the environmental science meets public health meets health in trying to work out can that change happen? Will people accept that change? Who's going to make that decision? So should we should we be testing vehicles more strictly, do you think? I understand that, for example, at the, where the policing stands in Hamilton or on East Broadway, there have been times when the concentration of toxins has well exceeded international internationally accepted standards. So if there's these people standing there on a regular basis every morning, they are being subject to possibly an undue burden. So should we not be um, testing vehicles more stringently? Would that be an option? That would be an option because the more data you have, the easier it is to move things forwards. Um, I'm a bit of a data geek. I find it hard to make any decision unless I've got hundreds of bits of information in front of me. And that's that's probably the best path forward. The more you measure, the more you learn. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean there'll be an instant answer over the next year, two years, five years, but unless you're kind of checking specific points and then trying to get more understanding, it's going to be hard to implement change. Yes, and I think that's what we're lacking. Um, if anybody else, is there another question there, Amy? Because I've got another one, but... So one's popped up. Oh, it's more of a comment than a question, but one I agree with. And again, this is something that society can change. Um, it's just how expensive it is to make healthy choices. Um, and that is a huge challenge, and it does come around to Big Brother control. It comes around a little bit to how you tax and how you price. And that's a hard decision. So I totally agree. It, the most healthy way to live is also the most expensive, which then drives health inequality. Uh, and we've got huge problems with health inequality. I uh, can't hear you, Amy. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts going on here. Um, actually, I had a question that that, um, that that this comment was relating to about, and you said health um, inequality uh, or inequity, um, and what can the government do to kind of make it more accessible to everyone on the island? Um, if that's a question that you could... <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so again, it, it, it's one that there's low-hanging fruit, and then there's challenges, and then there's really big challenges. And all, as always, the really big challenges are the hardest one to implement. So there is a publication called the Marmot Review, or the Marmot Publication about public health, um, which is fascinating. It shows that your social determinants of health, as in the way that you live, Mm -hmm. and determine how healthy you are, actually very little to do with things that are easy to control. It tends to be things that you're born with, so the type of house you're born into, the wealth of your parents, your access to education, and then your access to healthcare. So access to healthcare is something we talk about a lot, and there's a lot of things changing and happening at the minute, and ultimately making sure everyone has access to high quality healthcare is important but equally important is making sure everyone has access to high quality education um, everyone has access to exercise a lot of it is very very simple things to articulate incredibly hard things to implement mm -hmm. well they uh, recently have put a sugar tax um, on junk food but it seems that it hasn't really um, impacted the price of uh, healthy foods that they seem to have been driven up by it um, whereas I thought the idea was that it's supposed to kind of, you know, reduce your ability, you know, want to buy those uh, junk foods because they're more expensive and make you want to buy the healthy foods, but it seems to be the reverse. Yeah, and I think that's it's a really good example of where science in real life butt heads. Mm. So in theory, a sugar tax is great, just as kind of one-liner. Sugar's bad, tax it, make it more expensive, everything should get better. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been proven in a number of different areas that it's hard to implement and people manipulate the system unless you've got 
a huge number of people looking in every day and trying to work out and implement and kind of audit the changes made and tweak as you go, that it, it is hard to make it work in reality. Yeah. It shouldn't stop people trying. True. Um, I have a question from the audience. Uh, Marty Lloyd, do you know whether the pesticides commonly used by our farmers are car carcinogens? Honest answer is I don't know. Um, so we know a number of pesticides certainly are carcinogens, but I'm afraid I'm not up to date with what we use locally. Oh, there was a comment from the uh, audience as well about the duty on, on fruits and vegetables. Um, maybe the government needs to reduce customs duty on all fruits and vegetables, not just some. Um, would be a good idea. Sounds um, good. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, did you have any other questions? Oh, You're muted, I think, Jennifer. I have her muted. Sorry, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> okay, am I on? Avoid the feedback. Yeah. feedback. A good place to start would be the schools. I understand the education minister has um, wants to implement school gardens in every school, which obviously is a wonderful way to go because if children do it and take take ideas and things home parents will often follow. There should also be um, um, good nutritional lessons, practical lessons in all schools so that children know how to make inexpensive, healthy foods. And when I was teaching, which was a few years ago, so I don't know if it's changed or not, but they took away the children's playtime, this was in the middle school, because it didn't fit into the timetable properly. They wanted them to sit in the desk with the teacher, eat their fruit snack because that was healthy, but not be outside running around, which was nonsense. Um, so instead of decreasing the amount of activity in school, they should be increasing it. And, and those three would be relatively easy to implement, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. I, I um, remember being at school, it's not that long ago. Um, but they switched PE in my timetable. It, it almost felt like PE was a luxury and that it was kind of a way kids have a little blowout and it wasn't really needed for life. And so, yeah, we lost PE for science, which really irritated me, even though I ended up being reasonably sciencey. Um, but again, it's those kind of decisions that people make based on, I'm sure the person who wanted more science had very good reasons for it, but it's remarkable how many knock on effects there are. And yeah, undoubtedly improving our kids' education and our kids' lives, getting them exercising, getting them eating healthily is going to help. Um, again, the skeptical side of it is to see that change takes 20, 30 years. And people don't have patience. People want answers right now. They want facts and they want a change tomorrow. But the most important change is take years. True, yeah. So I was surprised, uh, Chris, that you didn't have on your hot topics COVID, not to bring it up over and over again. But you can't avoid it. And I know, well, we don't know maybe, but COVID doesn't cause cancer. But what have been the impacts on your uh, approach to, approaches to cancer treatments this year and, you know, your, your patients and whatnot with COVID? It's been huge. Um, I think, pleasingly, it's probably been less in Bermuda than in most countries. Um, I think, like everyone, the impact has been it's exhausting, it's relentless. Every time you make a decision, you know, you used to make 50, 100 decisions a day, and it now feels like it's 500 a day because every time you decide something, you've got to add in that extra information. Mm -hmm. um, the fear and the global conversation is people are accessing healthcare less at the moment because they're very fearful of going into healthcare and they're attributing things or they're hiding away things to put into the back of mind saying after COVID, I'll get that checked out which is obviously very dangerous across the board, particularly in cancer, um, because picking up cancer early is important. Again, just Bermuda-wise, we provide 90% of cancer care on island, between the radiation unit, the chemotherapy unit, the surgical stuff. But there's still 10% of stuff that people should go away. You know, I'd love all healthcare to be here in Bermuda, but it's not always going to be the way. And then that risk balance, you know, if you're sending someone overseas for an investigation, that is hopefully going to tell you something, but you're then putting them at risk of COVID compared to making a decision without information on island. That's really challenging because as doctors, you're driven by guidelines, driven by data. Everything should be evidence-based. 
And then COVID has just dropped a bomb on the evidence and you're having to make decisions based on anecdotal information that you spent your whole life being trained never to do. And so it's hard stuff. Yeah. Um, in comparison to other countries, how are we on cancer rates in Bermuda? Hi. Um, so at the moment, through a fund from the Health Council, um, we're trying to write a national or we are in the pre planning stage of a national cancer control plan where you're trying to pull that information together, try and really understand our risks, understand our burden. Uh, we have a tumor registry that does a good job, um, but mandating Regist mandated registration of cancer is not there, so we think we probably miss a few. But unfortunately, we're in the top end, whether in the 90th percentile, 95th percentile, in terms of our rates of cancer compared to most other countries. So, why that is comes to the whole talk: is that environmental? Is that behavioural? Is that genetic? Um, but unfortunately, we have a very large cancer burden in Bermuda compared to most countries. And is that all cancers, or ones in particular? So it's across the board. Um, there are certain cancers that have a higher prevalence. So um, skin cancer, you won't be surprised with the sun. We see more of, but then we do see more breast cancer, prostate cancer, oropharyngeal cancer, uh, internal spikes. So we're above the most people, and then we have very high breast cancer, prostate cancer, and oropharyngeal cancer rates compared to other countries. Um, and that can be, again, related to everything we've talked about. We know breast cancer risks go up with poor nutrition, lack of exercise, uh, alcohol, uh, being overweight, but it also goes up with genetic factors. So of course there's BRCA that is well known. It's a genetic mutation that you can inherit um, that can drive breast cancer as well. So I suspect like everything, it's multifactorial, but a lot of the stuff we can see, but implementing the change is the key. And are we doing any studies that are tracking all of those variables in Bermuda? Since we're, we're making small population, we could be a really good beta, you know, site. Yeah, so we're making progress, as I'm sure it is across the sciences, but particularly in healthcare, it's always been quite hard to do on island studies. We've got a small populations, so then in the variable, the variance is quite hard to control. But it shouldn't stop us trying, and we do get people reaching out to us quite regularly asking us to join studies um, and that is going to happen more. It's been very tough, it's very time consuming, mm -hmm. but it's something we should undoubtedly be doing because until you understand the problem properly, it's quite hard to get the solution right. Yeah. So if there's three top things that you as an individual would do to mitigate your chance of getting cancer, what would you say? Uh, sun cream and hats. <laughs> Regular exercise, more fruit and veg. And on a governmental level, what would be the top three things you would wish for to help make your job easier? Um, <laughs> education. So looking at schooling from a health perspective, not just an education perspective. Um, health prevention, which they are, but appreciating that health prevention is not a quick fix. It's not something you can implement next week and we're going to see the benefits in 2022. It's got to be a long game. It's got to be planned. Um, we need a strategy and that strategy needs to include next year, 2030, 2050. It can't just be, let's make a quick fix. Um, and then more access to exercise for the whole population. So prioritizing paths over vehicles. And if you have time for one last question, we have one from uh, Daniel F. Uh, are there any advances in pre-screening for uh, cancers, particularly for any that are often diagnosed at a later stage and therefore often require more aggressive treatment? So there are advances. Um, the biggest advances really at the moment and Bermuda orientated is not necessarily really fancy, sexy, different changes, new machines. We've got most things we need, but again, it's about organization and planning, working about who should be screened at what age. Um, the breast cancer screening, should it start at 40, 45, it should be individualized a little bit more. And the challenge is because the research is really done in Bermuda, you bring in an overseas regulation and then people are quite rightly pointing out that we're a different population and it kind of fractures and you lose that organization. So there are lots of things that people are doing, but there needs to be more coordination. Um, the big exciting thing coming in the future is blood tests. 
to try and diagnose cancer. So that's in the experimental phase. There's a few people looking at it. They've worked out you can potentially find evidence that cancer might grow in the next three to five years, but they haven't worked out what to do about it. Obviously, that's a really exciting step. But right at the moment, you can have a blood test in one of the um, trials, and it tells you you're going to get cancer in three to five years. It doesn't tell you which one. It doesn't tell you where. So at the moment, their intervention isn't there. So that's why it's not happening regularly. But that is going to be a big step forwards. I, just, I think it's five, ten or more years away, but that will make a massive, massive difference. Wonderful. Well, I see time's up and I know you have a lot to do, a lot of lives to save. Um, so we really appreciate your time and to echo um, the comment. Thank you so much. Um, it's been very informative and hopefully people have some um, things in their toolkit to help reduce their chances of getting cancer. And um, at least we know that we have um, someone on island who will take good care of us in the event that it does happen. I hope, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one ever really wants to meet me at work. It's no. Yeah. <laughs> so we appreciate Dr. Uh, Fosker and uh, thank you for your time and your expertise. You're welcome. Thank you for the invite. Thanks. Right. Right.